surprise. Wouldn't your wife or girlfriend love it if you treated her to the very best this Christmas? Now you can with the world's softest pajamas by Pajamagram. Created by a team of pajama experts, the world's softest PJs are lighter than a cloud, softer than a bunny, like cashmere, only better. She'll love how heavenly they feel. Includes free gift packaging and Christmas delivery is guaranteed. So visit pajamagram.com or call 1-800-GIVE-PJs. Welcome to the Right Time Podcast. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. We got football tonight. Thursday night football, a game that's actually of some consequence for matters that are important to people close to the game and people who are not. It is the Falcons and the Saints for people who are not close to the game. It matters because it's still got some playoff seed and stuff attached to it. Saints trying to hold on, trying to get themselves a bye. They're probably going to make the playoffs. The Falcons trying to get themselves into uh, the playoffs. Now, Shannon, they playing this game. at what, which, which Mercedes-Benz are they playing this one at? It, is, it, is it the Super One or just the other one? I guess it's just the other one, the new, the new one, the new hotness. All right, so it's at the, it's at it's right across the street from the it's from the George Dome. Oh, that parking lot is where the George Dome used to be. Anyway, we got that game. It is tonight. Now, I said something earlier today that seemed to get people a little charged up in some ways, and I'll get to that in just a second. But before I get into why it is that I believe that Falcon Saints is the best robbery in the NFL right now, let us speak on the fact that it is unquestionably the blackest robbery in the NFL. And if you don't believe me that it's the blackest robbery in the NFL, if you are in Atlanta today, Tell me, did you go to Lennox? Because if you went to Lennox, it was plenty black and it was plenty football. Shannon, I one time went to the Lennox. It was December 26th. I want to say 2012. I went to Lennox. The Packers and the Saints were playing that night on Monday Night Football. And, I mean, Lennox get black, but it ain't get no blacker than it did with all them Saints fans who came from New Orleans on that bus to come show up at the mall and then go to the game. No, 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 no. This is the best rivalry in the NFL, and it's not entirely tied to how black this rivalry is, but I would explain to you why the rivalry is so black and why that ties into the greatness of the rivalry. One thing you got to remember about Katrina, a whole lot of people left New Orleans, right? It was an outflow in that when it went down. You know where a whole lot of them moved to? Atlanta. Shannon, who you got as the Giants' biggest rival? Would y'all go with the Eagles or the Cowboys, maybe? And that's always a tricky one. I would probably, ooh. Cowboy fans? How's that? How about this? What if a couple hundred thousand of them just showed up in your in your city, just out of nowhere? We'll see this to week. stay. We'll see this weekend, huh? Oh, to stay. To oh, stay. Nah, nah, to they, stay. Nah, like they nah. live here now. They live here now, and they always talking to you about how it's better back where they were, and they complaining that your food ain't got enough seasoning on it and stuff like that. Can you imagine that? Like that's part of what this rivalry is. I think in its evolution is the evolution of what. Like the storm is always going to be part of discussing this because of the Steve Gleason play in two thousand six. Uh, now, as many of you know, I used to root for the Falcons, but I'm off that narcotic. I don't do that. In fact, I even remember that Steve Gleason play. People had to tell me about that later. I was like, what's the big deal about this? He blocked a punt. You know, good that the Saints got him a little victory. I didn't realize it was such a big deal for them. I did not. Oh, that's what you're doing? That, that's what you're doing? I just told you I ain't really tripping on that, and here you go trying to be a jerk about it. I got less of a problem with the actual play than the fact that you thought that that was an appropriate thing to do, Shannon. I was Look, I was due for this, Bo. It's been a tough football season for me. So any chance I get, the first thing I did when I came into work today was make sure that we had the audio of that pump block. Yeah, way to go. You got any audio of the wild card game in 1991? You got anything of that where the Saints hadn't won a playoff game in their whole existence and the Falcons came up in their crib and got them? You got any sound of that? Huh? Huh? I ain't think so. Haters. Anyway, the hate is real. Shannon, did you see the Mardi Gras float with the Young and the Ringless on it? Like the Young and the Ringless? A Mardi Gras float with a picture of Matt Ryan on it this year with the Young and the Ringless. Like, I don't see any more powerful vitriol that comes from one team to another than with the Saints fans going toward Falcons fans. What you got to remember about Saints-Falcons is this is a rivalry that I believe was primarily bred in mediocrity. Like, the Falcons threw a couple of little early playoff appearances in there. Like, I think they went in 75, somewhere in there. Like, I think they had one there, and then they went in 1980, right? They had that one. But, you know, Falcons ain't got no real illustrious history. Saints had not made the playoffs in their first 20 years of their raggedy little existence. They had not. It took them well deep into things before they got them a playoff win. I think that one against the Rams that year was the first time they'd ever won a playoff game. So these teams are sorry. 
And they were playing in the same division, and twice a year they got to be sorry with one another. And I felt like the the basically what you were fighting for there was as long as you don't lose to these cats, you're not the sorriest team in the league because it was just such an overwhelming collection of sorry because that's what it was rooting for the Saints, rooting for the Falcons. It was sorry. I understand, though, that a lot of these Saints fans out here right now don't really know nothing about rooting for the Saints when they were sorry because when the Saints were sorry, they weren't rooting for the Saints. You ain't, got to, you ain't got to lie to me about that. And by the way, I don't blame you for not rooting for the sorry Saints. Just don't be up in my face acting like you was rooting for them sorry Saints when the Saints were sorry and you wasn't rooting for them. You ain't got to lie to me. There's no need. You don't have to do that. You weren't rooting for them sorry jokers. Then they got themselves a little whiff of good. And then the most anomalous Super Bowl. All right, maybe not the most anomalous, but I feel like this. If you go through and you look at the list of teams that have won Super Bowls, There are like three or four that I believe stand out as being like truly anomalous when you look at the rest of their history. Uh, You can make the argument for the Kansas City Chiefs when, oh, sorry, five, forgot about the Jets. Shannon, we'd agree. The Jets, that would be an anomaly given their history. The Chiefs, I feel like, have had some consistent goodness. They just ain't got to the top, right? That doesn't feel fair to say about them. Uh, Let's keep going down here on this one. The Bears, what we call their 1985 Super Bowl anomalous. Although they've been twice, unlike the Saints. Yep, we get them off the anomalous. The Saints more anomalous than that one. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 2002, that would qualify as being an anomalous Super Bowl win. Like, damn, how'd y'all do that? And then we have the Saints. And the thing, you can't tell them nothing, Shannon. You can't tell them nothing. That's all, that's, it, that's all it took, huh? That's all it took. They got their one. That's they won. They got that Super Bowl. And when I did root for the Falcons, Actually, no, they won that Super Bowl after I quit rooting for the Falcons. I just kept hating the Saints. But you couldn't tell them nothing. What could you say? Like, that's the that's their big joker. And then you know what the little joker became? 28-3. to Saints wasn't even in that game. And then that turned into the little joker. And see, that's one difference between the Falcons and the Saints. The Saints' history of sorry doesn't really have anything that really just jumps off the screen about how truly sorry they actually were. The Falcons have incredible moments in sorryosity. That we could make like a dun 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 dun. Like we could come up with some music about how sorry that they were in the moments that pointed out they sorry. Saints were just so sorry. I feel like Shannon, the only memory we got really truly is Saints sorry is NFL films, RG uh, Madden running for his life. Like, oh, there they come again. Or the images of the uh, ants with the fans with the yes. bags over there. Paper heads. bags. The paper bags. In fact, I feel like I'm responsible for the Saints having a relatively successful season this year because I normally send out the tweets with the paper bags for the Saints fans to get ready. I ain't send one out this year. Next thing you know, they out here running the ball, playing smash mouth football, everything else. But I love this. I love this because the people hate each other that much. And it doesn't seem like a totally negative sort of hate, right? It's not a terribly unhealthy brand of hate and again this is the blackest robbery in the nfl by the way you know why this is the blackest robbery in the nfl and i do think there's something to this because if you've been paying any attention to what people have been talking about with the fans and the protest and who's with it and who's not and everything else is worth pointing out as i said was well, that this is the closest thing we got to a uh, hbcu robbery it may not be uh cu but it is definitely hb Right, That is what we have because Arthur Blank, when he bought that team, he figured out the thing about Atlanta that most people don't get. People say that Atlanta is a, is a poor sports town. People say that Atlanta fans are fair weather and don't show up. No, the problem with Atlanta is Atlanta is a segregated town, and you weren't going to be able to sell out those buildings unless you made a real live push to black season ticket holders and black ticket buyers in general. We've seen the Fal- I mean, the Hawks do more of that recently. Shannon, they play all the hippity hop. They got the organ player. You know what I mean? They're going there. Arthur Blake came in the door and was like, oh, so their money spends the same? Well, I guess I'll be offering my seats up to them, too. And that stadium is a different in-stadium experience than anywhere else. And then, Shannon, you get a whole bunch of people from New Orleans. Well, even the white folks. The, is it fair to say, like, Harry Connick Jr., for example, can you name a black or white man a Harry Connick Jr.? I feel like there's a bunch of white folks that's listening to this right now that ain't never heard how Harry Connick Jr. really talks. His, his Michael Jackson voice. Harry Connor Jr. be out here sounding like one of the Neville brothers. Also, um, on this, my man just sent this in. The mayors of uh, Atlanta and New Orleans are named Keisha and LaToya. Yes. New Orleans got a LaToya. I did not know that. So we got a Keisha. And a, so I think, we, I think we summed this up. This is, in fact, the blackest rivalry in the NFL. And I look like Steelers Ravens, for example, it's good because the football is good, right? Like if the Steelers and Ravens did not have good football, that robbery would not be what it is. 
I don't think it matters what the record is at all between the Falcons and the Saints. That's just some powerful hate. All right, so when it comes to uh, Saints and Falcons, right, before the game, you don't tailgate. It's a cookout, right? Correct. So, so essentially it's a classic. Yes, it is a classic. That is exactly what it is. It is. A, what can we call this classic? You know what? That's what we need to make the poll of. During the break, we're going to come up with some names. I guess it would have to be the Mercedes-Benz classic now, right? Would it have to be? The Benzo classic? The Benzino classic? We'll, that think, what it, we'll think of something, but, yes, probably Mercedes-Benz has to be tied to it. No, but it's definitely a classic. I also feel like both those teams should have marching bands. I think they're selling themselves short. And it ain't they, hard to put together a marching band in New Orleans. And they play in the Dome, too. Like it's a nat- Both teams, like a natural fit. Every year, we getting this. That's what I'm saying. It's all right here. It's all set up. And, by the way, Shannon, in domes that people often use for big events. There it is. Like Battle of the Bands. If the NFL hired me, your ratings would stink and skyrocket. Don't nobody care about the protests at a classic. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Kian Fahey is in studio. We'll join us next segment. Kian Fahey at presnapreads.com will join us at 430 Eastern. He's sitting here right now with a red Tyrone Biggum Scully, but he doesn't know who Tyrone Biggum is, so I just keep saying that, and we laughing, and he not. It happens. You got a beak on your hat. I do have a beak on my hat. You're damn right. I just, you know, well, look up Tyrone Biggums. It'll make sense. 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. And hey, stop Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, no contracts. Hey, just saw Tyrone Biggums. There we go. <laughs> Day's been made. Um, so we were just talking last segment about the Falcons and the Saints. We got to figure out what we're going to call this classic, Shannon. Somebody said, how about the Crawfish and Crunk Classic? Alliteration. I like that. I like that. Somebody also said the Dirty South Classic. I can see that. Uh, right. Cadillac Classic. I think it's a very cadillac affair. Wouldn't you agree? It is a Cadillac affair, but both teams play in a Mercedes-Benz sponsored stadium, though. But you can't take the Cadillac out of people's souls. It's not possible. Doesn't work that way. They got a Mercedes with with the wheel on the back. Have you ever seen a Mercedes with the wheel? Well, I guess the G-Wagon, but that ain't no, that's not what we talking about here. I'm talking about a coupe with the wheel on the back. I ain't seen that. Anyway, we're going to keep working on it and let y'all vote. 888-729-3776, 888-729-3776, that is our telephone number. So Mike Mitchell plays for the Steelers. Mike Mitchell's one of these guys that could be like one of eight different dudes in the NFL. I'm not sure who exactly I'm mixing him up with, but he could be like one of eight dudes in the NFL. Anyway, um, play safety for the Steelers. They came to ask him some questions after Juju wound up getting suspended and after the Georgia local suspension was overturned. And um, Mike Mitchell actually was kind of team Aloka on this one because Mike Mitchell is team knocked the hell out of people. Listen to him end of the day this is football if you want to see flag football then let's take our pads off that would make it easier for me because now i don't got to wear heavy but give us flags for me to pull off because that way i know what we're playing you know i signed up to play full speed contact football and we're not doing that i feel like i gotta ask a guy hey are you ready for me to hit you right now before i hit you and that's crazy i mean i kind of do see where he is coming from on that right like i totally get where he is coming from because they are you went from you're supposed to knock the hell out of people to okay just get them down which is like a total change in what the game has been and i did think mike mitchell made a compelling point right here where he was talking about a fine that he had received previously that wound up being reduced on a play involving andy dalton and the cleveland and the cincinnati Bengals. i'm gonna mess around and get hurt trying to protect an offensive player because he's running an over route damn it your quarterback shouldn't have threw that ball messed up that happened two years ago. That's I, I'm, I'm not joking at all. Andy Dalton threw a ball to Tyler Eifert two years ago. Tyler Eifert had to die for it. I was aiming for his gut. But if he don't die, if he don't get in the head. That's 50 grand out of my pocket, though, because Andy throws a bad ball. Make that make sense. He is right about that, by the way. Shannon, what they call that in football, a hospital ball? You ever heard that one? Those dudes throw them hospital balls? I'm, I'm sure you're going to have a uh, Eli Manning joke in here somewhere. So I, had not, I was waiting on it. I was waiting on it. Well, who did he throw a hospital ball off? Who hasn't he thrown a hospital ball Oh, okay. My fault. I didn't realize that I had tapped into your own little personal issues. I was just talking about what was going on in general, that he had to get up any giantness. I mean, it was the Odell Beckham initial ankle injury, and he went high and got hit low. Uh, yeah, that was a bit of a hospital ball. But – but the the point though is that quarterbacks throw hospital balls. You think they're gonna start? Uh, they gonna start finding quarterbacks throwing those hospital balls? Like I mean, but that's that's part of it. I think the point he makes is a good one. It's a bad pass. I make the play that I'm supposed to make. This dude does what he has to do to adjust to a bad pass. Now it's costing me money out of my pocket. I think he has a point there. And speaking of having a point, he decided while I'm here, let me holler at your man Raj. 
It's just so much going on in the game right now. Yes, obviously I'm a little flustered, but I mean, we just got to do better. We got to do better. I said it yesterday. We got to do better as players when we sign the next CBA. We got to get better leadership as who's running the league because obviously everybody from fans, owners, players, all disappointed in Roger Goodell. We just, we just got to do better. We can't have a guy where you just hand out discipline on how you see fit. There needs to be a set guideline of how we do what we do. All right, Shannon, where are you going on this one, L.A. or the Bay for Mike Mitchell? I, I'll go – I'll go L.A. Ah, trick question, apparently. Kentucky. Okay, that doesn't make sense because I heard him reference uh, that he has a cousin, I think family members in Cincinnati. Oh, Oh, that did explain how it was that he had family members in Cincinnati. Okay, I was hearing a lot of Cali in his mouth, but no, he is actually from a town called Fort Thomas, Kentucky. That, Shannon, also get the feeling, given the way he talks about hitting people, that sounds like a town that he is unwilling to return to. I heard a lot of can't go back. In Mike Mitchell, because that fifty thousand dollars, you think that fifty thousand dollars ain't no big deal? Mike Mitchell, like man, I can get back none of this money. <laughs> I need it all. I cannot go back to where I was before. I cannot do that. But I thought he made some good points. In fact, Dominique Foxworth also thought that he made some good points. Uh, he was on outside the lines today saying he agreed with Mike Mitchell. I agree with Mike Mitchell for most of what he's saying. I think the problem is that. The NFL wants to change the perception. They're trying to evolve the game to a point, or at least evolve the perception of the game to a point where we think of football like every other sport and not like the kind of excessively violent game that it is. And I think that's the problem is they don't want to accept those two things, and they're trying to force players to evolve in a way that they just can't fast enough. I mean, there's something to that, right? Like, how do you change what you've been doing forever in these moments like these? How are you supposed to do that? I've said this before. I ain't never seen anybody ever get fired for hitting somebody too hard, but we have all seen people get fired for letting people catch the ball in front of them. And it's going to take a long time for the NFL to make peace with that reality. Uh, One last thing for Dominique, though, and he's talking about this with the NFL. The NFL, they got to know you can only make this game so safe, but they also need people to think it's safer than it is. It's not fair. The NFL is not looking for fairness, though. Like I mentioned, they're trying to change the perception. It's not a fair expectation to find a guy for a play like this. Like, we all see what's happening, but it, it doesn't matter whether they want the players or the DBs to feel like the, the game is fair. They want people to believe that the game is safe. And the most ironic part about this is we want to legislate out hits like this and the Juju Smith-Schuster hit, but the game isn't actually getting any safer. The scariest play that we witnessed was a play with Ryan Shazier that will never go away as long as football happens. And the sub-concussive episodes that uh, contribute to CTE, those aren't going to go away unless we switch to flag football like uh, Mike mentioned. So, like I mentioned before, it's just about them changing perception. It's not actually about addressing the fundamental issues with uh, health and safety for the players. Well, I think he, what he made there was, by the way, a great point. We done all this talking about Smith-Schuster and about Aloka. Yo, there was a dude that couldn't move his legs on the field. And we got nothing to say about that because there is no measure. Like, there's no controversy there. There's no, so what do you think about this? So we don't bro- broach that as topics on these networks that we work on because we need things that got a couple sides people to lean on. Ain't no couple sides to lean on. Paralysis, bad But it happened in a very, very everyday sort of way. And they're not going to be able to fix that part. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Check him out at presnapreads.com. Also on the Nickel Package Podcast. He is in the studio with us today. His name is Ken Fahey. He got the red scully on. I say like Tyrone Biggums. And he looked up Tyrone Biggums and... Look, look, there's nothing you can say to me right now that's going to make me feel bad because I just took a picture with Tony Reale. And it's, it's, <laughs> as I described it, it's like shooting trees next to Steph. It's a way, like, I, I have all these insecurities I didn't know I have. No. <laughs> He's one of my favorite human beings in the world. Now, the Browns. they Reale. Probably- yeah. Yeah, well, oh, I was, oh, I was going to let, okay. let it flow. I was going <laughs> to let it flow. All right, the Browns, uh, Executive Vice President Sashi Brown has been fired. Now, the thing about this is they had the whole analytics movement with the Browns, but they made the man in charge not a football man. He was a lawyer, basically, before this. Do you think they made the right move? Like, they had, like, seven football guys before Sashi Brown, so it's not like they can just say that's gonna that was the problem, and they probably will go for a football guy now because NFL teams tend to go in the opposite extreme whenever they fire someone. This I rarely get mad with, with the NFL and stuff like this, but this is one of the things that kind of made me mad because it's just flat-out dumb. Like you, you hired this guy, and the plan all along was, we're going to lose now so we can win later. So when you lose now, you get frustrated and you get rid of him. One of the... 
so you can you can talk you can break it down a lot in a lot of different ways. I try and focus on what's on the field, so I'll try and stick there. A lot of the talk is oh he he skipped Carson Wentz, he skipped the Sean Watson. But if you put those guys on that roster, they're not going to look like the guy, the the guys they look like in their rookie season. Rashard Higgins isn't DeAndre Hopkins. He's not Alshon Jeffrey. The offensive line isn't the same. But the biggest reason that they are zero and sixteen, the biggest or the biggest reason they're on course to be zero and sixteen is Hugh Jackson. Hugh Jackson was a really, really good coach in Cincinnati. A guy I was really excited about this year with a rookie quarterback with an improved offense. But he's, his play calling this year has been illogical. They throw the ball downfield at an outrageous rate, the receivers who aren't able to get open downfield. And it, it's why it's so frustrating, because it feels like they've picked Hugh Jackson over Sashi Brown. And I, Sashi Brown is a GM. They were in the early stages. I think the one thing that's been unfair with him, outside of the actual firing, but the perception and the, the talk of him afterwards is that he didn't pick the right players. Like, no, GM's going to hit on every pick, but I think he picked relatively good players. He did really well so far. Miles Garrett looks phenomenal. Corey Coleman's been hurt. We haven't really got a look at him yet. And the, the, the later picks, like you're still waiting on them, but there looks like there is actual talent there. Now, you do a lot of film work, but where are you on the idea about doing baseball-style analytics with football? Um, it's useful for trends. It's useful for looking at formations. It's more useful for me in terms of uh, game planning rather than evaluating talent. Uh, the one thing that kind of stood out to me with this was it's less about the analytics and the numbers. It's more about the philosophy that they took on. And this shouldn't be something that's kind of crazy to anyone because it's what pretty much, as far as I know, everyone does when they play Madden. You kind of trade your picks down, you get a bunch of picks, and you kind of get future picks, stock up in future picks, sim the season forward. You can't do that now, and that's why you got fired. But you sim the, the, the season forward, and then you have all these draft picks, and you can build this awesome team. And that's what the Browns are going to do. And that's the kind of the benefit of the analytics to me is they are set up. Like, like no matter who the Browns bring in now, unless they bring in someone who's a complete disaster, they're going to be 500 pretty quickly because they've got, what, two first-round picks next year, like six second-round picks over the next couple of years. They're going to be able to build a phenomenal roster. All right, John DeKean Fahey, Priest at Reeves. Com here on the right time. Uh, switching gears, how was the first game of Jimmy Garoppolo? He actually played pretty well. I, I think the, the first thing you have to note, though, the 49ers did a, a pretty good job of keeping Akeem Hicks and some of those crazy Bears pass rushers off, of, off his back. He had clean pockets to work from, and it was a very cautious game plan, but that's what Kyle Shanahan does, so that's what he's going to be playing in moving forward. What stood out with him, uh, his intermediate passes were really good. He got the ball out with good timing. It came out quickly. The velocity he had hitting, hitting receivers in stride. He had one interception, and it was actually kind of a really intercep- interesting play because it's one that's difficult for me. Like you asked about analytics a minute ago. One of the things I do is charting with spreadsheets. And the big challenge of charting with spreadsheets is when you come to a play, it has to go on one or the other. You can't kind of say it's ambiguous and you're not 100% certain in the middle if you want to get every single play accounted for. And on that play... The receiver actually gets both hands on the ball and the defensive back undercuts him and takes it out of his hands. But you can say that the quarterback threw it a little bit behind him and a little bit high. If he puts it in a perfect spot, it doesn't get intercepted. And that kind of brings you to what margin of error do you expect? For me, it probably goes down as the quarterback's fault because it's just that slight bit behind where it should be. But that, that's that's nitpicking. Overall, he played pretty well, and he, he they, they won on field goals. They didn't win on touchdowns, so you're not giving him too much credit, but he was fine. Well, one thing we talked about before with him was how do you know if this guy is some kind of franchise quarterback? People convinced themselves of that while he was not playing. Do you think there's enough time left in the season for you to get a handle on what they've got? Yeah, you give me 200 pass attempts, you give me 250-odd plays where you can evaluate him sacks, you can evaluate audibles to running plays and stuff like that. I think you get a you get a, you get a good grip on a guy, but at the moment he's still at about, what, 145, something like that, so I'll give it two or three more games. I, I also don't really buy into this idea that like he, he hasn't been there long enough to learn the offense. He's been there, what, a month now? Must be at least a month. That he, He's got enough time to, to be a judge now. All right, Tony Keen Fahey, presnapreeze.com, here on the right time. Uh, switching gears back to the Browns. How did Josh Gordon look? Phenomenal. Man, he's he's going to have a 200-yard game at some point before the end of the season. He His first target was over the middle. He, he ran between two defenders on a slant route. The ball was slightly behind. It was meant to be behind because there was a linebacker underneath. He reached back, plucked it out of the air with his fingers, and fell, fell in for about a nine-yard gain. But it was the second target that he had in that game that really stood out because, remember, you remember Josh Gordon when he was back in the day. All you, all you saw with him was he's running downfield and no one's running with him. And on the second target, there was a safety who lined up, I'd say, 20 yards off the line of scrimmage, who dropped deep at the snap, kept dropping deep, and Josh Gordon just ran right by him. It did not matter. That's a professional athlete, and Gordon went right past him. The ball was slightly overthrown, so Kaiser missed him, and he didn't have a chance to make a play on it. And then later in the game, in about I think it was the third quarter, uh, Kai, uh, got, Josh Gordon got off the line of scrimmage and got downfield. 
Uh, he, he was broken on the inside shoulder of the cornerback. Again, would have been a long touchdown if Kaiser hadn't thrown the ball over towards the sideline. That Those two plays were... Those were what kept his numbers down. He had one one of his biggest plays. He had, his biggest play came late in the game, but his most impressive play where he actually caught the ball was a play where he beat the defender off the line of scrimmage. Wasn't a great release, but as you know with Josh Gordon, because he's so physically talented, because he's so big, he was able to brush off the defender even though the defender got a good position. Got downfield, Kaiser again, another poor ball. And he's actually been a really good deep passer as a rookie, which was so this was a surprising game, and it's why I think he'll probably why Josh Gordon will have a big game moving forward, because Kaiser is a good deep passer in general. But he got downfield, had to reach back over the defensive back and pull it in. And those kind of ball skills, for all that Gordon did when he had huge numbers, those kind of ball skills weren't always there. So he might have even gotten better while he was out. All right, Donnie Keane Fahey of the Nickel Package Podcast here on the right time. All right, we got the upside matchup of the week. we got Sammy Watkins going up against the Eagles. What do you see there? Yeah, I wanted to talk about Watkins this week because it feels like we haven't really talked about him that much. He's, I think he's having a great year. His numbers aren't huge, but he's playing a really specific role in that offense. And the Eagles cornerbacks at like Ronald Darby's, they're actually, this is the, the kind of the Buffalo Bills trade bowl, I guess, because Ronald Darby was traded away from the Bills as well. He won't be able to stick with Watkins. Jalen Mills is there. He won't be able to stick with Watkins either. If that offensive line for the Rams can hold up against the Eagles defensive line, Watkins could go off. You down to do one more, man? You just hanging around? Nah, I've got nothing else to do. Yeah, I was about to say, it's cold outside, too. That's Key and Fahey, PreSapBreeze.com, and the Nickel Package Podcast. This holiday season, Upside.com is giving all business travelers the gift of a better business travel experience. Just book your next trip at Upside.com. You deserve a better business trip. Upside.com. Hey, girl, have you done something new with your scales? Using new moisturizer? Nice. It really brings out the hazel in your eyes. Oh, hold on. Are you using whitening strips, too? Your fangs look good, girl. Really good. A really charming snake charmer? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to Geico. Wait, what? Have you been doing Pilates, too? Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Key and Faye here, pre-snapreads.com, the Nickel Package Podcast in studio with us, hanging out for one more segment. Also, check the Twitter account at ESPN Radio, at the ESPN Radio Twitter account at ESPN Radio. We try to come up with a name for the Falcon Saints game. And Shannon, we got some, uh, some dork. Let me find a dork. Uh, what's the dork's name? The dork's name is John. This is a joke. You have to keep in mind that Bomani is going to exaggerate anything that involves Texas or Atlanta because he has connections to both. Very easy to see if you listen to him long enough, to which I'll say, A, thanks for listening. B, we did a whole radio segment about this. This robbery is pretty cold. You just don't know. You dork. All right, well, we got a Twitter poll up on the ESPN Radio account right now asking if this matchup were an HBCU classic, what would the name be? We listed three options, and we also have other up there as well if you want to give your suggestion. Right now, the options, Dirty South Classic, Battle at the Benz, or Crawfish and Crump Classic. I'm a little worried about these people and their own suggestions because not everybody's in on the joke. I'm a little worried you're going to ask me for one. No, 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 no. I think we're going to give you a little time <laughs> to ease into this Americanness. Kia Fahey is on with us. All right, so we're going to talk a little more football. Alba Kamara, uh, you see, hear Sean Payton say earlier that he felt like the only person stopping him from being Rookie of the Year was Sean Payton. How good's he been this year? Actually, the only Sean Payton quote that I really liked, and this is kind of a, a sidetrack, side but he said if if we thought Alvin Kamara was going to be this good, we would have taken him higher, which is kind of a nice thing to hear because normally coaches will pretend they knew all along and they were waiting for him to fall and stuff like that. But yeah, he's Kamara. Like it feels like Kareem Hunt was like the first eight weeks of the season was this freak running back doing things that no one had seen, and then Kamara kind of just picked up the baton since then and has, has emerged. And he's doing things that are very very rare because. Like, for about three weeks, the Saints kept running screens, and not once did any of his blockers block anyone, and Kamara was still gaining 20 yards all the time. And in this game against, uh, in the game last week against the Panthers, he sealed it at the very end on a screenplay where it was well blocked, but the, 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 the timing was thrown off by a defender underneath, working, uh, working underneath Drew Brees' eyes. And it forced Kamara to adjust as soon as he caught the ball, and he had to cut back across the field, and that's the one thing you never want guys to do. And as soon as it happened, it was like, He's only in trouble, but because of his speed and because of his quickness of action, he was able to keep getting away from people. And you like this because of the Texas connection. But Jamal Charles, I haven't seen anyone play like this since Jamal Charles. And Jamal Charles, at his peak before his second ACL tear, was phenomenal. Yeah, that's world class speed that you're talking about yeah, when you yeah. have Jamal and someone, Charles. Someone asked me this week, it was like, uh, is he who's faster or, or does is Tyreek Hill the guy who should be compared to Jamal Charles? Tyreek Hill is really fast on a straight line. When I'm talking about Alvin Kamara, I'm talking about reaction speed, I'm talking about balance, I'm talking about that little bit of acceleration and the second burst of acceleration. It's all right now, it's just it's crazy because you can perfectly defend him and you're still not going to get him down. All right, John DeKean Fahey, the Nickel Package Podcast here on the right time. Uh, Shannon wants to know if you think Ben McAdoo should have been fired. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, Shannon, a big Ben McAdoo fan. <laughs> He's all over his face. So I think it's uh, it's something you probably have to talk a lot longer about. But uh, yeah, he should have been fired. But the whole mess of the last couple of weeks has kind of made it all really confusing. He should never have been hired in the first place. Him and Dirk Cutter in Tampa Bay were hired because they were the, the teams were scared of losing them. They thought they were so important as offensive coordinators that you moved them into head coaches. And McAdoo wasn't a great offensive coordinator. The difference there was Kevin Gilbride was an awful offensive coordinator, and he replaced Kevin Gilbride, changed the style of the offense. It became this short passing, shotgun heavy, three receivers, one tight end on over 95% of the plays. And Eli is a smart quarterback. Eli is a technically refined quarterback, even though we call him a turnover machine or whatever. But when he was in that offense, it was able to work. So Eli, in the, in the season before McAdoo arrived, threw 27 interceptions and 551 attempts. The two years when McAdoo was the offensive coordinator, he threw 28 on 1,219. That's a totally different situation. But it's a different situation because it's a different style of offense. It's not like Sean McVay in the, with the Rams. It's not like it's a brilliant offense. It was just a different style. And that's where they messed up from the very start. And you're a little higher on Eli than most people. <laughs> I'm a little higher on Eli than you, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'm about to say, Eli and Ryan Ted Hill are the two where I look at you and I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> so that's what I know when I get fired and kicked off the show. It's like, Tannehill comes back and throws two picks. No, I was higher on Eli just because of what I said about Kevin Gilbride. He was in this offense where you've got to throw the ball downfield with anticipation into tiny windows while under pressure. Any quarterback who does that is going to have worse numbers than the guy who's throwing short from clean pockets. All right, talk to Kian Fay here, pre-snapbreeze.com here on the right time. All right, we got a big game this week, Eagles and Rams. Where are you looking on that one? I'm really fascinated by this game because not only are the two kind of teams that we didn't expect to be where they are, but Jared Goff has had like one, he's, he's kind of had a very consistent year week to week because of the setup of that offense, but he's had one game where it was like, oh yeah, he's looking, he's getting exposed a little bit, and it was against the Vikings. And that game they scored, I think it was one touchdown overall. I think they added a field goal or something as well with it. But that touchdown came in on the first drive. It's the scripted plays. It's McVay knew exactly what to do to get the defense off balance and attack it. After that, Mike Zimmer adjusted and they shut him down completely. They were able to get pressure on him and he completely fell apart. And I'm wondering if the Eagles are going to be able to do that because their defensive front is phenomenal. And if they, don't, if they do do that, then it, it might be a little bit of a blowout. But if they don't do that, the Rams have all these weapons. They have all this quality to go after the Eagles secondary. And that might make it one of these games where we're looking at like both teams in the 30s coming down to the last couple of minutes. Now, what about the other side where I know you were not high on the Rams linebackers, but the defense has not been bad over there this year? It hasn't been, and you can attribute that to Wade Phillips, but the I'm always going to be reluctant to buy in on them right now because they have these linebackers. Like, Mark Barron's a safety. He plays a lot of linebacker. He plays at the line scrimmage a lot. He makes kind of big plays that get no, get noticed. Alec Ogletree last week made a huge play, then looked like he hurt himself on a, on a flip in the end zone, which is kind of sums up his career because he does a lot of dumb stuff. These guys don't get off blocks. So if you can block the defensive line, if you can handle Aaron Donald, and if you can pull a lineman coming around the corner and get him on Ogletree's body, you will run for 30 yards. Alvin Kamara, who we talked about a while ago, had a 7-yard touchdown run against them. They ran relatively well in that game. Sean Payton's play calling was a, bit, a little bit questionable. So I feel like if you get the right matchup, and the Eagles did it a couple of weeks ago against the Cowboys where they kept trapping linemen, they kept using misdirection runs, if they go to that offense, that might be very effective against them. Now, Aaron Donald, has his play this year been up to usual standard? Because I feel like we're not talking about him as much this year, now that the rest of the Rams are decent. <laughs> well, you have to kind of look at how teams approach him, too, because he's been in the league a little bit for a while. Aaron Donald is, like, remember Ndam Kumsu? Remember he had 10, was it 10 sacks his first season? And he was this really productive player, and people kind of thought he's going to have 10 sacks every year. That's never going to be what you are as a defensive tackle. It's why J.J. Watt was so rare, even though he moves outside. Like, you look at Calais Campbell, the role he played in the Arizona defense last year, opposed to this year with the Jaguars. With the Jaguars, he gets, in the, in, he gets more production sack-wise because he gets to go upfield a lot more. I'm not concerned about Aaron Donald at all. He's providing value. It's disruption. He, he's making team defenses call certain plays. He's making the quarterback get rid of the ball quicker. You don't worry about him. He, guys like him, he's like Odell Beckham. Unless there's like blatant drops, you're not going to worry about him. All right, that is Key and Fahey. Check him out, presnapbreeze.com. Also, the Nickel Package Podcast. Hope you're enjoying the country. I was going to say the city, but I guess it's bigger than that. You got to do L.A. Now you're doing New York? Uh, I should have done it last second. <laughs> yeah, it's a little breezy up here, but man, thank you so much. The right time with Bomani Jones. All right, so uh, we have new LeVar Ball news. What is the new LeVar Ball news? LeVar Ball has pulled LiAngelo out of UCLA. We knew that, but now LiAngelo and LaMelo will sign with Harrison Gaines, who is um, Lonzo's agent. So, no, LaMelo will not be playing college basketball, although she had anything you could play college basketball if you had your own shoe, right? Like if you were being used to push a shoe, didn't that mean basically you weren't going to be playing college basketball in the first place? Essentially, yeah. 
Steve Alford, like, oop, one less thing I got to deal with. But anyway, these boys are going to are siding with an agent, and the plan is for them to go play for a team overseas. Here's what LeVar had to say. He said, quote, I don't care about the money. I want them to go somewhere where they will play them together on the court at the same time. The priority is for the boys to play on the same team. And Shannon, I feel like they could do that at 24-hour fitness or perhaps in some semi-pro league. Do they really need to go around the world to do this? And speaking of playing around the world, uh, is uh, LiAngelo still allowed to play in China? Ah, that's a very good question. China, as he calls it? Yeah, that's a very good question. Now, I am intrigued by this for a number of reasons. Number one, I don't have any problem with the idea that LaMelo Ball is not going to play college basketball. Play college basketball for what? Like, you got to explain to me what it is that he's going to get out of college basketball that absolutely cannot be replicated. I think that some people have made the argument that they're being deprived of the collegiate experience, but I feel like you guys need to read up on what college athletics is and ask how much it truly compares to what is the collegiate experience. Um, But... LeVar wants them to go overseas and to do this. I do not know if this is the best idea. Again, I don't necessarily have a problem with the idea. I don't know if it is the best idea. I think it is asking a lot of a 16-year-old to move around the world. Now, LeVar says that he'll be over there and they'll have uncles who are over there with them and all of those things, but I still... Even though guys in Europe do this all of the time, this seems very difficult for me to grasp as an idea of something to do. Think about Brandon Jennings, who graduated from high school. He went overseas to play ball, and you ask him about it, man. He's like, yo, it was rough. You talk to Emmanuel Moutier, like, yo, it was rough. And you're not just going to be over there playing against uh, grown men. You're going to be over there playing against grown men who are trying to get on. Like, Shannon, can you imagine who the can't-go-back all-stars are that are playing ball in Europe? That's an international level of can't-go-back. You that's, gotta, not, that's not just local. You got to realize how adamant you are to not go back to be willing to go to like the Ukraine or one of those other places you probably hadn't heard of until your agent called you. I told you about the one time I talked to this cat who was like a little international player of sorts, and they asked, we asked him where he was thinking about playing. He's like, I don't know. Agent said I ran Cyprus, one of them. He wasn't. Although I don't think he had a problem with go, with coming back so much as he knew he shouldn't stay, if that made any sense. But, um. LeVar, I wondered when I this first came up, my question was, like, how much input do these youngsters have in these decisions? And I became torn about that discussion because LaMelo really isn't, like, how much input is LaMelo supposed to have at 16? I don't think you have to listen to 16-year-olds. I do think LiAngelo was at an age where that's someone that you have to listen to. And I wondered if he wanted to stay at UCLA. I wondered if he was having fun at UCLA because I could see him having fun at UCLA, and I've also wondered with LiAngelo and the bold plans for the brand and everything else, LiAngelo is unlikely to be an NBA player. LeVar has talked about this with a bit of an understanding that he's probably not an NBA player unless he plays with his brothers. Um, But do they want this? And Lonzo said that they all got together as a family and they all gave their input, and then this decision was made. Shannon, how do you think a discussion goes with LeVar Ball in the front of it talking about let me get your input? Discussion? Well, in order to have a discussion, you have to have a give and take, more than one person talking. I doubt very much that this was a discussion. Yeah, I'd be very curious to know how that discussion went. Like, if somebody could show me some videotape of that discussion, because I don't even know if Lonzo know what an actual discussion is when it relates to his dad, or how much of that is just a bunch of listening, right? Yeah, you're right, Dad. Yeah, 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 you're right. No, I won't go to class. No, 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 I'm good. No, I'm good. I'm straight. I'm straight. Here's my thing, though. You guys need to be straight with yourselves about what you claim your problems are or are not with this. And if your problem is that you feel like LaMelo Ball needs to have his full high school experience, have you been paying attention to college basketball? Like for a while, do you think it's like a real high school experience when you get these cats like Kevin Durant who go to three different high schools and these dudes wind up going to these prep schools where they're just there, basically just there to play basketball? All right? Like one thing we always notice is in college sports – um, I remember this when Ty Lawson was at North Carolina, and just about every year it was a question of whether or not Ty Lawson was going to leave school. And I remember I talked to a cat who played ball at that time, and he's like, no, 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 you got to understand these prep school kids, man. It's a job for these guys the second that you send them off to a prep school to play basketball. Once you send them off to a prep school to play basketball, it's always trying to get to the league because the whole purpose of going to that prep school basically was to get to the league. The notion of a like high school experience or a college experience with these guys is flawed. We've taken that whole thing away. These cats are reclassifying themselves, putting themselves in different grades, graduating early than they plan to, holding back so they can be bigger than the other kids and everything else. Man, people have been mutating the notion of a high school and college experience for so long, but you don't notice it because it's within the construct of that which you are familiar. I don't think that what LaMelo is doing is any different than sending your kid to go to Oak Hill. The difference is Oak Hill is in the United States. And I, again, agree. There are questions to be asked about whether or not it's the best idea to go across the world to become a grown-up when you are 16 years old. I think that's a fair question to ask. 
However, I don't think this is nearly as crazy as a lot of people are making it out to be. I don't. I don't think that this is nearly as absurd as a lot of people are making it out to be. And, hey, man, you might as well get some bread. Now, here's what I want to know, Shannon. What are they doing with this bread? Because LeVar is talking about building the big ball of bread and everything else. Um, is right, How much of that is Lonzo money? Like, where the bread coming from? Look, it, it, all, it all goes in the pot. You, they like the Wu-Tang Clan? Everybody gotta, put put a percentage into the the production company. You got to spend money to make money. I got I I like I I that there are all kinds of questions I have about just how it is that this operation is being bankrolled. But it's so wild how so many of us are able to see through and recognize the farce that is so called amateur athletics in the NCAA. But the second that somebody talks about engineering a plan that does not involve going there, you go right back to the cliche narratives about it. You go right back to talking about, well, a college education is forever. Dudes are going to be in college for a year. Right? They're going to be in college for one year. Well, I hate that they're not getting a, a college experience. Their experience wasn't going to be the standard college experience like the college experience that you had. We could go through all these different things, but we are so we are so naturally tied to and so naturally wedded to the idea that you are supposed to go to college that even those of us who intellectually understand that what is quote unquote college in this case is not the same, we still bristle right fast at that idea of oh my God, you're not gonna go to college? But you can go to college. And now I still think this is my general belief about life. College is the best bridge that they have come up with between childhood and adulthood. It's the best one. They haven't come up with anything better yet to give you that taste of freedom while also having enough constraints around you that, you know, in case you mess up, you got room to do so. I still think that college is the best place for you to do that. I also understand that college is a bit of a farce in terms for athletes. So I can't necessarily encourage that people go sign up to be in the machine that is college athletics. But I still think that college athletics is probably the best way to do this. It's probably the best way to get ready in the best place for you to mature. Now, what will be interesting to me about LaMelo is LaMelo been a big deal everywhere he's been. He's been a big deal at Chino Hills. He had a big deal at these AAU tournaments. They're not necessarily going to care about him over there. And Shannon, he's going to be running into the hardest screens. Can you imagine being 16 and built like LaMelo or running into one of them grown-up Euro screens? Like this cat's over there is going to be trying to get to the NBA setting screens alone. That's what I do. I just stand here. And, and, and see, it's going to be different, too, because if you remember a couple years ago, was it Jeremy Tyler out yes. of uh, what I believe was the L.A. area or San Diego? San Diego. Me. And he skipped, what, his uh, senior high school. He yep. played overseas for, what, two years because he was Never heard eligible. from him again, right? He played a couple. He had a couple stints in the NBA, the Knicks for one, but he, he never really amounted to that star potential that he could have. But what I'm, what I'm saying is he found it tough, just use, as you said, with Brandon Jennings. And this dude is, what, 6'10". So imagine a guy like LaMelo, whose body hasn't developed yet, going against these grown men overseas. Yeah, and Tyler wound up feeling like he got caught in other people's agendas, right? Like, that that was part of the thing with him, which I think, is again, is a fair question to ask about what's going on here. But I know who is happy about this news. Magic. Magic, like, so let me get this straight. You saying that you're going to have to spend weeks at a time out of the country over there with LaMelo? Yeah, 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 I think it's a great idea. Yeah, 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 I'll think about drafting him. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, 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 whatever. Just go. Just go. Just get on the plane. Like, actually, it's not so much Magic because Magic ain't worried about it. It's Luke Walton. Luke Walton over there like, look, if you need me to write a letter of recommendation for your boy, don't, you know, just come holler at me. I'll do whatever I can to get you up. I mean, whatever it takes to advance the basketball careers of your sons. 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. Give us a call. Coming up next, there's another level of this uh, LeVar, LiAngelo, LaMelo situation that we're missing. Is 19 years old actually adult? The right time with Bomani Jones. Talked a little bit earlier about the Saints-Falcons being the best rivalry in the NFL. We got a salty Saints fan on the line. Let's talk to Kevin from Ohio. Kevin, why are you so salty? Hey, Bomani, how you doing? Doing all right, man. Hey, first off, I'm going to take Grambling or Southern with the Saints against any other band that you decide to take versus us. I'll say it right that. off the bat. I'm with that. Have some. Second of all, let me tell you something. I've been a Saints fan since 1988, all right? Born in 82, Saints fan since 88. And we had some bad, bad, bad teams, bro. Don't tell me that we were not around rooting for our team. Whoa, hold on, hold on, buddy. Hold on, hold on there, buddy. 1988, the Saints made the playoffs. Those were the glory days of the Saints. That's not the misery of the Saints. When they were sorry was way before that. That's actually when they was halfway good. 
Uh, they were okay, and that's still got my dog patrol shit. But I tell you what, I was around when Dicker had his three and thirteen two <laughs> years in a row, and I was going to the phone for that. But let me tell you something. I will tell you this, and this is bad respect to you. Who that nation? We were listening to you today after the Super Bowl, when you gave probably the best segment in sports that I've ever heard in my life. And guess what, everybody? Y'all should know. America knows. Knowledge. We hate y'all in Atlanta. We can't stand y'all. Everything Romani said was the truth. We don't like you. Can't stand you. Your city smells. And I tell you what, I can't wait for the money. Yeah, Kevin, appreciate the call. Uh, I do kind of want to uh, make a bit of a point there as he – he said something I was going to say something about, but then he went so like deep into his hatred, Shannon, that I just kind of forgot what it was that I was going to say about these. Ooh, the Saints. Was it the 88 season? No. No, no. He said he thought about the. I don't, I don't care about the Falcons anymore. Saints fans are so difficult not to despise. Like in everything about them in the core of their souls. It beca- Oh, that's, that's what I was going to have a problem with. Stop saying who that nation. There ain't no who that nation. Okay, there is not. Y'all got 504, maybe some of 225. Y'all are not a nation. I think you can look this up. The state that, the, well, I forget how the percentage, basically the, the lowest percentage of people from a state who actually move out of the state is Louisiana. Y'all ain't no nation. Although I can make the argument that Louisiana is like another country. Third world country, I guess we don't use that term anymore. Developing nation, to be exact. There we go. And just as a reminder, we have a poll up on the ESPN Radio Twitter account because Pomani considers Saints v. Falcons the best rivalry in the NFL. And we think this matchup feels like an HBCU classic. So if we were to have an HBCU classic featuring the Saints and the Falcons, what would that classic's name be? Right now we have the Dirty South Classic, Battle at the Beds, Crawfish and Crump Classic, or other. So please submit your vote there. Who that nation? You know what that reminds me of when Notre Dame fans be talking to me about we the Irish nation. You know what the Irish nation is? Ireland. That's what the Irish nation is. That's right, Ken. It's Ireland. Ain't no Irish nation. Like, no, if you want to go to Irish nation, get a plane ticket and a passport. Same with the who that nation. Nation. Just a bunch of people from Louisiana. That's all it is. Anyway, we were talking about LeVar Ball and uh, signing his kids up with agents to go overseas. And I wound up in discussion. My man Ryan Jones used to work at Slam. Maybe still works at Slam. I don't know. But Ryan Jones was talking to him about this. Uh, my man Tony Pisati up there in, um, up, in the, up in the West. We were talking to him a little bit about this. And it got into this interesting discussion of how old is 19, right? Dave Chappelle did this routine that I don't know if he could get away with doing in 2017 about how old really is 15. It's absolutely fascinating intellectual exercise that he goes through there with some graphic things that I don't think that he could do in this day and age. But anyway, the logic behind it is fascinating, which is basically the idea of how grown or how childish we think somebody is when they're 15 is fluid based on the agenda that somebody has while they're in the course of the discussion. 19 is totally that place. So we're at this point now in our society where parents, I feel like, are way more involved in the lives of their college age and post-college age children than they have been previously. I saw a story not that long ago by these damn millennials, and it was talking about how these jobs, when they do like their job fairs and their hiring, they have an open house for parents so that parents can come in and see if they feel comfortable with their kids going to work at a place like that. And I can't imagine entertaining somebody's parents at a day, at a damn job. What I'm going to look like doing that? Like, I, I can't I can't grasp that. Uh, when I worked as a college professor, I was fortunate. I never had to deal with anybody's parents hitting me up with questions about their kids or anything else. But college professors talk about this all the time, that they deal with more emails and more phone calls from parents and questions and everything else for people who are, in theory, grown. So I've heard people raise the point, and I think it's a fair one, in, in at least on its face, about LeVar coming in. Can he tell LiAngelo, you're not going to UCLA anymore? Like, can he do that? Should he be able to do that? Right? And the answer is, if most of your parents had walked in when you were 19 and been like, you coming home, you were going to be coming home. In part because they'd be like, I ain't paying for it no more. Now, you can say LiAngelo's on a scholarship or whatever it is, but let's not pretend as though 19-year-olds are that independent of their parents. Let's not act like, like if you want to be independent of your parents at 19, there's only one way to do it. Get a job. Get a job. Get a lease. That's the only way you can do it. But you know what the problem with that is, Shannon? You got a job and a lease, and now you got to pay it. Being independent from your parents means not taking no money from your parents. See, that's the thing. Being independent from your parents means what? Being independent. Meaning Which is that's all you. Being independent is so great when you out staying out as late as you want to. It's so bad when they're cutting off your lights. 
It is an an awful thing under those circumstances. It seems so great on its face. It really does. So I agree. I worry about how Dominier and LeVar is on his lives with these kids because I have no idea what these kids actually want. Like, do they want the big baller brand? Do they all want to play together? How does Lonzo feel about this? Because Lonzo is floating this whole situation. However, don't let your agenda, your distaste for LeVar Ball get you in a place where you're acting like you don't know what 19 and 20 really is, right? Like you're acting like 19 and 20 gets to do whatever it is in the world that they want to do no 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 you don't get to do that that's not it because we know 19 is only but so grown and it's funny when you like somebody and they get in trouble at 19 oh he's just a kid he's 19 when you don't like somebody and they get in trouble at 19 i mean try him as an adult he is an adult yeah that's the other part too shannon people talk about depending on how they feel about 19 they try to lock kids up at 14 but if it's a 19 year old they like hey it's just a kid just kidding. Nah, he's a kid. He's going to make some mistakes. Yeah, that's all it's going to be. That's the game. All right, 888-729-3776. That is our telephone number uh, talking about the Saints and this uh, who that nation and stuff. Some guy said, how do I feel about Raider Nation? I think the Raiders have an actual real live national fan base, right? Like, I think there's there's so many different places where you can wind up and the Raiders have fans that show up. It ain't like that with the Saints. Like, maybe a bunch of Saints fans show up after they get off the mega bus. That mega bus coming from Louisiana, because that's where y'all at. Somebody said, I'm in my feelings about the Falcons. Fool, you don't understand this. I don't care about the Falcons. I hate you. Those two things have now become totally separate points, Michael Williams. Chad, you can vouch for this because people think I'm making this up. When the Falcons lost the Super Bowl, did you notice any pain in me or any hurt or anything like that at all? No, 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 because it was a bunch of told you so's. Yep, yep. Whatever happened to that dude that came up on me while I was out with a woman and he was out with a woman and tried to talk slick to me walking past me talking about I heard what you were saying about Atlanta on the day of the Super Bowl. Should have clowned him like LeBron clowned that dude last night. That's your girl because she's filming me, you bum. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. All guests join us on the Shell Penzo performance line, just like our next guest. Check him out on the Jump and on ESPN, talking about the NBA. He's in studio today. His name is Steven Jackson. Steven, what did you think when you heard about the idea of LeVar Ball sending Leangelo and LaMelo over to play overseas? Uh, you know, uh, well, at the end of the day, they're not going to play at UCLA. Neither one of them was going to get a chance to pass. So that was a smart thing. I mean, it's to get them playing, keep them around basketball, get them away from here. For a while, let them go overseas and play basketball and continue to work on their game without a distraction. I think it's smart. I don't think the older brother has a chance to get to the NBA. I know the younger brother is going to be a star. I really feel like he has the best chance. But to send them overseas to get them playing basketball and away from all the nonsense is, is super smart. Now, you played overseas when you were young. How tough is the adjustment for you? It's hard. I mean, it's definitely hard. See, they're in different situations. You know, they're from Chino Hills. Their parents got money. They got, uh, before they go overseas, they got Ferraris and all this stuff. Me, when I went to over, when I went overseas, all I, I didn't have a dime to my name, you know I didn't have nothing. I I was I was fresh off the block, you know. My mama really didn't want to see me. I had to get a passport just to go out there. I, that was my really first time being out the country. It was it was my first time, so it was hard for me. I didn't speak Spanish, you know. I I didn't I didn't I didn't know anything. So it, it was it was it was a culture shock for me. It was a it was a life experience for me. I tell you, because the first day I got there to Venezuela, uh, my driver picks me up. And uh, we got to go straight to practice as he picks me up, and uh, we get to we get to like where we're going under a bridge, but there's like four cars in front of us, and the cars just stop. So traffic is moving slow, and he like and he's trying to tell me you know what's going on, but I really didn't understand Spanish. My driver, but we get closer to the like two cars from under the bridge, and it's a 14 year old kid that just jumped off a bridge like right in front of us and landed right there on the ground. So that was my first day in Venezuela. I wanted to go I wanted to go home, but it wasn't my first time seeing death. And I knew what I was there for. I knew it, it was it was my road to get to the NBA. So that first day, it kind of it kind of killed my confidence, but it made me stronger at the same time. I talked to Stephen Jackson on the right time, and I tell people all the time. I talk to you about this that you were like the first NBA player I ever saw in high school. We were like, "Yo, that dude is going to the NBA." <laughs> how, how, how much of a change was it for you though to be around people where they didn't really care who you were? Like they weren't calling you the wonder in intros when you got to Venezuela, right? Well, you know, it, like I said, it was it was different. You know, you know, for, even for me, you know, every everything I wanted, I had to order. You know, I had to point to it. You know, I, I, I had, to, I honestly, what I honestly did was when I got there. You know, I was eighteen, I was nineteen actually. I um actually got a couple of chicks, 
that understood what I was saying and it kind of translated with them and made them move in with me. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, I, I had I had I had two I had two chicks move in with me that that didn't speak the language. I mean, that spoke the language and also kind of understood what I was saying. You know, I made them understood what I needed. And uh, and uh, it worked. You know, I paid them to stay at my house, cook, clean, and go get me everything I need. You know, even 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 when I needed a little smoke, you know, they knew where to get that from too. So it was it was it was, it was smart. One thing about me, I can adjust anywhere because when you come from nothing, you know how to make it nothing out of something. <laughs> you are the man, right? I think if anything is like solidified, the fact that you are the man that you showed up in Venezuela, didn't speak no Spanish, and moved in two people, one bag with one bag, and made it happen <laughs> and took care of them. Now let me say this. I went out there and made thirty five thousand. I probably came home with about four bucks, but I enjoyed myself. Those ladies, I changed them ladies' lives, and I learned a little Spanish. <laughs> We're talking to Steven Jackson here on the right time. Now, sticking with this man, what do you think has been the biggest issue for Lonzo? Is it really just the shot? No, nah, I ain't the shot. People, I, I, I think people are too hard on him, but you know, it's it's all the after effect of his dad running his mouth. I, you know, he's going through what every rookie goes through. You know, as a rookie year in the NBA, the game's different. You're playing against the best talent in the world. You're playing against talent you've never seen before. You know, the season's longer. The line is longer. Like, everything is new to this kid. But for the most part, he's handling it like a G. You know, he's not getting kicked out of the game. He's not panicking. He's not going to kill his teammates. He's not blaming it on nobody else. He's just thinking too much. And I, I kind of blame it on, on Luke Walton. You know, every time you ask Luke Walton about him, Luke say, he's going to be fine. Uh, he's a good, tough kid. Da, da, da. No, Luke, stop giving him the gas, okay? Stop putting batteries in the back. What you need to tell him is, Lonzo, look, stop worrying about what everybody's saying. Stop worrying about all the pressure your dad put on you. Stop worrying about people saying you're J-Kid and you're Magic Johnson. Go out there and do what you've been doing your whole life, what you know how to do and what you love, and that's play basketball. Next year, you worry about the other stuff. You're a rookie. you got to learn the game now. Well, do you think that Magic has also been a part of that? Because Magic says we're going to retire his jersey. Well, the different thing with Magic, yeah, Magic is trying to give him confidence, but you got to think Magic is looking out for his organization too. So for the most part, I know Magic then had that conversation with him as a player. You know, Magic's a real one. I'm pretty sure Magic is going to have a time where if he hasn't already, put him to the side and just look, play the game, let us handle everything else. But as a head coach, Luke got to be more real with him. All right, we're talking to Steven Jackson here on The Right Time. Uh, what do you think about Kevin Durant making it look like he wanted something with Boogie Cousins? Man, I don't know why people think KD's a punk, man. KD, KD from Maryland, Baltimore. Ain't no punks out there. I don't know no punks from Maryland to Baltimore. Me, personally. And, you know, I don't speak on stuff I don't know. And I don't, I, don't, I don't need friends. I don't need nobody to be my friend. So I ain't vouching for nobody for no type of accolades. Kevin, I don't think KD's a punk. And I know for sure Boogie Cousins ain't no punk. But I know for sure that they really didn't want to fight either. You know, it, it was a little argument. They got kicked out, and everybody got everybody gets seems like everybody gets madder when people get in between them. Okay, what? you wasn't that mad when wasn't nobody, and everybody getting mad because you got people there to break it up. They didn't really want to fight, and I, I don't, I never, I didn't, I don't think those guys really have bad blood. It was just you know the passion and and, and the moment of the game because it, at the end of the day, if you want to fight, it's easy to throw a punch. Can't nobody stop you when you're seven foot. If you want to throw a punch, if you're seven foot, two hundred something pounds, you want to throw people out the way and throw, and throw punches. It's that easy. I can do it at, at two fifty, so I know they can do it at two seventy. Well, do you think the league almost makes this happen because they've eliminated? Like I talked to somebody about this. We're the first. This is the first generation of people who have never seen their favorite players get into a fight. So then, when these things happen, it seems like everybody has to, at the very least, show that they're willing, even if they know it's not going to be a fight. Yeah, because they know. All they have to do is look at the Kobe, the Kobe and Chris Childs fight. Chris Childs was, is the pro at it. Man, listen, NBA fight. You throw the first two punches, you know they coming. You throw the first two and land them, you win. You look like the gangster to the whole world. All right? And that, that's just how NBA fights all, all last. The first two punches, if you throw the first two, you know they come and break it up, get out of the way, you win. At least you don't look like a punk. We are talking to Steven Jackson here on the right time. Before we let you go, man, what have you thought about the Cavs in this, uh, I guess, 13-game winning streak now? I'm, I'm Honestly, Vermont, I'm not, I'm not surprised. I said before the season, the best – and the most experienced roster in the NBA is is Cleveland. They have they have a from one to fifteen. They have a solid roster, experience, championship experience, playoff experience, solid defenders, role players. They have it all, but they have the king. Excuse me, <clears throat> I didn't say that right. They have the king, K A N G, and he's gonna be the king until he decides not to be the king. He's getting better. Fifteen years in, he always figures it out. People like to say stuff or this that. You don't do nothing but piss LeBron off. He always figure it out, and I'm not surprised at all. All right, now, do you think that Derrick Rose being away has helped them? 
Nah, man. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to be the person to jump on D Rose and say him, him being there is not helping him because the first thing it could be a possibility Isaiah can come back and hurt him. So, uh, Derrick Rose has been through a lot, man. I'm actually pulling for the game, but I'm glad he's coming back. I hope he can just get back to playing basketball because I still feel like he has some left. But for the most part, they, they, Derrick Rose and Isaiah can really help this team get a championship. Well, what do you think about the way that a lot of people have piled on to Derrick Rose? Because at one point, everybody loved him because he wasn't LeBron, and then the turn came. Yeah, well, I mean, what have you done for me lately? That's why. You know, that, that, if, if LeBron got hurt and play, didn't play for a year or two, they're going to be killing him too. You know, he, he hasn't he hasn't really done anything in the game, and he, he's making a lot of money from Adidas. He's made, got some big contracts. And, you know, people expected a lot from him, but, you know, you can't expect what he can't give. You know, he's been through a lot. That is the great Steven Jackson of Port Arthur, Texas. My man, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Man, any time for you, my brother. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. All guests join us on the Shell Pencil Performance Line. Just like our next guest, he's a writer at GoVols247.com. His name is Wes Rucker. All right, Wes, uh, Phil Fulmer, more important that he solved this coaching search thing or that he won the 1998 National Championship? Right now, I think it's probably more important that he won that 1998 National Championship because there are uh, people who got a lot of faith in him as a result of that. It's, it's been a, a really, really rough year or decade for Tennessee athletics, I guess, and and they just kind of want a big old blue-eyed teddy bear back in there, and they've got him, so I think that will stabilize things for a little bit. Now, one thing you've said about him is that he is one of the best politicians that you have ever seen. So what were the politics that he had to navigate in order to make this happen? Uh, you mean the hire itself or getting yes, a job? the hire. Well, I, I think that, that, you know, people always use that cliche football guy, but Phil Fulmer uh, is part politician, part football guy. And, and I think he, he clearly wanted Tennessee to kind of reestablish its identity as one of those kind of physical, grueling SEC kind of teams. And, and it was pretty clear that by the end of it, I mean, he looked at Chad Morris a little bit, but he looked at the defensive coordinators at Alabama, Auburn, and Georgia. And, and I'll say this. If anyone knows much about Phil Boomer, they know that man loathes the University of Alabama more than anybody could possibly <laughs> loathe the University of Alabama. So for him to go out there and hire this guy who's an Alabama native, former Alabama defensive back, former Alabama assistant coach, and former Alabama coordinator, I mean, I'm telling you, Bo, he, uh, Pruitt had to just crush that interview. He had to hit that thing like a – Giancarlo Stanton distance uh, to get this job. We're going to talk to Wes Rucker of GoVols247.com here on The Right Time. Now, the names that we heard about uh, former hiring, Kevin Steele, Mel Tucker, and Jeremy Pruitt all have in common former Nick Saban assistants. Is he trying to out Saban Saban at Tennessee? That's a great question, and that's not maybe the route I would go because I don't think you're going to do what Alabama does and what Georgia does better than the way Bama and Georgia are doing it right now. But you know, that's what Phil Fulmer wants to do. Uh, you know, you could make the argument that before you become a national championship program, you need to make yourself a, a consistent 8-9-10 win program. And, and maybe this is the kind of move that does that. But, you know, Tennessee, uh, I don't know if a lot of people realize this, Tennessee is the only team in the SEC East that has to play Bama every single season. So Tennessee gets put behind the eight ball in the East race to start pretty much every season as long as Saban's there. So, you know, maybe they said, you know what, they they went with a different guy, an offensive-minded guy for the past five years. It didn't work, so go get one of Saban's guys. It worked for Georgia. Now, Pruitt is interesting because he was really the hot name in 2013 when he coordinated that Florida State defense, but he didn't go for a head job then. He's 43 years old right now. What do you think about him as a hire for this job? I think it's uh, certainly a risk, but it's got a lot of upside on it. You know, there's no way around saying this is a – a guy who has never been a head coach, not at the high school level, not at the small college level, not at the SEC level. He's never been a head coach. And he's, he's going into to one of the what top 10 winningest programs in college football history, a uh, place with an enormous, passionate, uh, occasionally vitriolic fan base when things aren't going well. There's a lot of things that are going to come across his desk now that he's never had to deal with. Now, I, I will say this. You don't know that part, and it's a big risk. But this guy has everything else. Uh, this guy has got the exact resume that you'd want if you have to go the coordinator route. Uh, he, he's one of the best recruiters probably in college football. He, he's got a lot of got a lot of personality. He, he's got a lot of football guys who like him. So it's not hard to, to sit there and extrapolate this and to say that he can be a head coach. But you know what? In, until bulls start flying, you have no idea. Now we're talking to Wes Rucker of GoVols247.com here on The Right Time. Do we know what what Pruitt might want to do offensively? That's a great question. Uh, I think that the guys he's looking at right now, I know he's looking at uh, Clay Helton's younger brother, 
who's that quarterback's coach, has been working with Sam Donald the past couple of years at USC. I think he's looking at him. Uh, I think he would maybe even consider Mike Loxley, who's currently Alabama's defensive co- uh, offensive coordinator, I should say. So uh, I think Pruitt's definitely a defense guy, and you know that he's going to run that variation of that 3 4 bear kind of hybrid thing that Bama and Georgia do. We know that on defense. Now, what we don't know is on offense, and, and I think you're probably going to see some kind of a pro spread, but it's hard for me to – to say right now, but if I had to guess, I'd say something like a pro spread. Now, how? what do you think of the Tennessee job at this point? Because I think because of the chaos, people have really devalued what they think this job is and what the ceiling is. Where do you think it is? I mean, I, I think you could argue that it, historically it's a top-ten job. Right now it's not a top-ten job. But, you, you know, when you come to this place, I, I think you see something that could be turned into a winner again really quickly. I mean, you've got some of the best facilities in the country – You've got a fan base that's as big as just about anywhere in the country. You got SEC network money funneling into there. You got a lot of big time boosters. Uh, you got a lot of tradition there. I mean, college football has been played since 1869. That's not really a small cross section. This thing's been going on for a long time, and I think only eight programs have won more than Tennessee. So, yeah, I mean, they've not been doing it right for the past decade, but they've had Derek Dooley and Butch Jones. So, uh, again, I, I don't know that you're you're looking at that from. I, I don't know that you're saying you can't win there. I think you're saying that mediocre coaches can't win there. But if this guy's a good coach, I think he'll go out there and win because, you know, you look at the talent in this state now. I mean, I don't know if people across the country know this, but Nashville might be the fastest growing city in the country. I think something like 80 to 85 people per day are moving into Nashville, and you're getting better players out of there all the time. So I don't know that, that you're ever going to say this job is – you know, the the USC job or Florida or Texas or one of those, Florida State, Bama. But I think you could say that pretty quickly you could turn this into a top-10 job again. It's got everything you need from that perspective. You you can be pretty much – I think you can get to like a half or two-thirds of the country's population within one day's drive of this place. So you can go recruit anywhere. Also, correct me if I'm wrong, talent hasn't been the problem except for that little stretch where Derek Dooley decided not to recruit an offensive lineman. Oh, there's no doubt. I mean, they had to replace those six or seven guys who went to the NFL last year, and those are guys like Barnett, Kamara, Sutton. Those are Reese Maven. Those are all guys who are starting or making a big impact right now in the NFL as rookies, Josh Malone. Too. So, you know, they had a lot to replace this season. Uh, they had a lot of injuries, and that's going to happen. But, yeah, I mean, this isn't the kind of thing where if you look at a team and say it's an 0-8 SEC team, you know you're not dealing with the most talented team in the league. But if anyone steps into that room with some of those players and says this is the worst roster in the SEC, they're crazy. I mean, Tennessee this year had a freshman offensive lineman who if he could declare for the draft early like in the NBA, he would be gone in the first couple rounds. They've got some talent on this team. What they need is someone to kind of put them in a direction to succeed and and be a good football coach. So I don't think they're going to go out there and – roll the ball out there and beat Bama and Georgia next season. But I don't think this is a, you know, a four or five year process with the roster they have now. All right. We're talking to Wes Rucker, go ball 24, seven.com here on the right time. Um, in looking at this with Phil Fulmer making this decision to bring in Pruitt, uh, has Jimmy Haslam been demoted as the king of the boosters? That's a great question. And, and there's a lot of, I mean, I've said before, this thing's been like game of Thrones, you know, chaos is a ladder and, and Phil Fulmer can work that ladder as well as anyone I've been around. So, I think there's certainly something to be said because you know that that whole Shiano thing would not have gone down if the Haslam family hadn't been behind it. You know, there's a lot of big boosters at Tennessee, but no one wields a bigger ax than, than the Haslams do. So, yeah, I mean, I I don't think that – from what I've heard anyway to this point, and I can't prove it, I don't have it enough to, to firmly report it, but I don't know that the Haslams love this hire. And if this is a situation where you're finally starting to hire some guys – that maybe wouldn't be at the top of the Haslam's list. Yeah, you you've done changed the game a little bit. You you've worked some game theory. You know you've done some things. So I don't know that I'm going to call it a complete power shift because I know how many millions of dollars. You know every building on that campus basically is named after one of the Haslam's. You know they, they run the state. They, they 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 have their own little empire here. So I don't know that you're ever going to throw them out of the equation. But you could say the past month maybe their effect has been minimized a little bit. And to clarify for those who don't know, uh, Jimmy Haslam, you know, owns Fly and Jay and owns the Browns. Can you tell people what his brother does? Yeah, his brother is uh, the governor of the state <laughs> of Tennessee. So, and some people think might be a senator one day. And, and their, their, their father 
Big Jim is the one who, you know, th- their their family owns something like 70% of a $34 billion company. So, you know, they, they've they got money. Uh, that ain't the problem. But, yeah, they uh, this basically is – Tennessee is almost kind of their hermit kingdom. So, yeah, they, they, they are – uh, as powerful in this state as just about any family could be in any state. All right, that is Wes Rucker. Check him out, GoVols247.com. My man, thanks so much. I appreciate it. No problem. Anytime, Bob. Thanks for listening to the Right Time Podcast. Please come back tomorrow for more. And don't forget to listen to the Right Time with Bomani Jones from 4 p.m. to 7 Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app.